Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before we get started, please note that closed captioning is available for this program, and you can view them by clicking show subtitle at the bottom of your screen. Though participants will be muted throughout the program, we encourage you to use the reactions function also located at the bottom of your screen if you feel so moved. During the meeting, you can also use the chat box to communicate with hosts and submit questions. At the end, we'll open it up to everyone to chat with each other. Please note that tonight's meeting is being recorded and will be shared with you later on. Now, please welcome Federation's President, Mark Levitt. Emily, thank you very much and welcome everyone to Federation's 2021 annual meeting. It's wonderful to see everyone and it will be even better next year when we can gather in person uh, for this event. Tonight, we will have uh, keynote remarks from Nadine Epstein of Moment Magazine, and of course, the election of Federation's incoming board of directors. But first, I have the honor of introducing my longtime friend, Rabbi Sid Schwarz, to share a Devar Torah. Among many other accomplishments, Sid was the founder and longtime rabbi of Adat Shalom Reconstructionist Congregation in Bethesda, and the founder and longtime CEO of Panim, the Institute for Jewish Leadership and Values. Sid is truly a social entrepreneur, a brilliant author and teacher, and currently a senior fellow at Chazon, the Jewish Lab for Sustainability. Sid, thank you for joining us tonight and for inspiring us with some words of Torah. Very much my pleasure, Mark. It's an honor to be here. And it's a special privilege to be asked to share a few words of Torah at this Federation annual meeting as it marks the end of the presidency of my dear friend, Mark Levitt. Uh, I don't know about you, but I got in my uh, mailbox today uh, the current issue of the Washington Jewish Week with a gigantic picture of Mark. It's about the size of the cutouts you find down at the White House. And I'm going to get him to autograph it when I next see him. Mark has contributed to our community in so many ways, including several years as my partner when he was the chairman of the board of Panim, the Institute for Jewish Leadership and Values. We all owe Mark and Federation CEO Gil Proust a debt of gratitude for their masterful stewardship of Federation through the COVID-19 pandemic. Most Jews associate the Federation as the central address of the Jewish community and as the entity that both raises money from the Jewish community and then determines the best way to allocate those funds to support the Jewish community and the state of Israel. I certainly believe in the worthiness of that mission. I've said many times to Jewish audiences that a contribution to the Federation is the voluntary tax you pay for the privilege of being a citizen of the Jewish people. But no less important is the role the Federation plays in modeling civic responsibility. Living as we do at a time when there has been serious erosion in the, in the civic fabric of American society, modeling civic responsibility is no small matter. A great mashal example of this principle comes in the second chapter of the book of Exodus. Moses, raised as a prince of Egypt in the house of Pharaoh, is strolling on the grounds when he happens upon an Egyptian taskmaster beating a Hebrew slave. He reacts not as an heir to the empire, but rather as a person of compassion. Perhaps he's been told by his mother, who actually nursed him, that he was himself an Ivri, a Jew. Verse 2 reads, he looks this way and that and sees that there is no man. And so he comes to the defense of the Hebrew slave, slays the Egyptian, and hides him in the sand. Some commentators wonder if Moses is trying to get away with murder. Why the looking around? But I see something else. The key is the meaning of the word ish, man in the verse. I don't think Moses is thinking about 
his own safety. I think he's getting a personal wake up call about moral civic responsibility. In chapter two of Perkei Vot, The Ethics of Our Ancestors, we read, Literally, it means, in a place where there are no men, strive to be a man. But that translation makes no sense at all. Ish, or the plural anashim, in this context, means someone of moral courage. The translation of Ish makes the Mishnah become a powerful lesson if we translate Ish properly. And that would be as follows. In a place where there is no one of moral courage, strive to be courageous. Moses, raised in privilege, suddenly comes face to face with suffering. He has the white privilege of turning away and saying, not my problem, man. But something stirs inside him. Not only compassion, but also identification with the other, with the marginalized, with the oppressed. And when he looks around and sees no one with the courage to intervene, he knows it must fall to him to be a protector of the defenseless. It is a test of his character. It is Moses' mitzvah moment. We might even call it his bar mitzvah. Bimakom she'en anashim tishadel yot ish. Moses finds himself in a place where there is no one else of moral courage and he summons the courage to act. To my mind, this is the primary mandate of Judaism to all of us. The Federation embodies this value day in and day out as it has for generations. Federation does this for our community, for the Jewish people, and for the state of Israel, and wherever people of any faith, race or nationality are in distress. Given the challenges of our time, may we all be blessed with the increased moral courage to do what must be done. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Sid, for those wonderful, inspiring words of Torah. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for this virtual gathering tonight. As Mark said, we hope to be gathering soon in person and to be able to connect with each other face to face. I would like to extend a special welcome to the extended Levitt clan who joined us this evening from around the country. I would also like to begin with some very specific thank yous. Mark, thank you for your partnership and friendship. I'm grateful to have weathered this storm alongside you. It has not been an easy two years, but I can think of no one else who I would have rather partnered with in coming through all these challenges so well. Our community is stronger because of you and your leadership. Sam, I look forward to all we're going to accomplish together as you take on your new role as a president of the Federation. I hope, though I cannot promise, that things will be a little calmer this coming year and years. And to our incredible Federation professional staff, you have my utmost gratitude and appreciation for everything that you do day in and day out. Your collective accomplishments this year, as we all navigated a global health and economic crisis, has been nothing short of remarkable. Each and every one of you has truly changed the world in which we live. I also want to offer my profound thanks to every donor, leader, and community member who stepped up and pitched in during one of the most challenging years on record. In the face of an unpredictable multi-layered crisis, our community responded quickly and effectively to a full range of needs. This was a time when community mattered and I was humbled by the way every single one of you showed up for one another. I wanna note a few highlights of what we were able to do this year. By August, 2020, nearly 900 donors contributed more than $4.4 million for the COVID-19 relief and human service efforts. And this is on top of everything that we raised as part of the regular annual campaign. In addition, 
a generous matching grant to the Jewish Federations of North America and several national foundations enabled us to add nearly another $2 million to our human service efforts that we'll be using over the coming years. Because of these resources, we were able to distribute nearly $1 million in emergency grants to individuals and families in the community. We allocated 1.2 million in scholarships and financial aid to help families participate in Jew Jewish early childhood education, day schools, and summer camps. And we invested close to $2 million to help vital agencies in our area survive the pandemic, including Capital Camps and Retreat Center and our local JCCs. We created a new Jewish community support line, 703J Caring, that we launched in partnership with JESA and six human service agencies that has since connected hundreds of community members with local resources. And then notably, we saw a transformation in the way organizations and people across our community thought and worked together. We saw an unprecedented level of collaboration, creativity, and sheer effort to make sure that we collectively came through this, not only as we were before, but even stronger. Teams joined forces to create entirely new systems and programs to help people in need and keep everyone afloat. Before we move on and start thinking about this coming year, I just want us to pause for a second, each and every one of us, to reflect on the incredible impact that we collectively had on the lives of so many people and on the Jewish community. It is easy to simply go forward and think about what is coming next without pausing and really appreciating what everyone has done. We should feel immensely proud of what we were able to do together over the past 16 months. Now, admittedly, there is something awfully straightforward about a crisis. During COVID-19, we did not have to think too much about our priorities or what needed to happen to sustain our community. We could make quick decisions knowing that our actions were benefiting people in need. But moving forward, things will likely be a lot less clear. But I might add, and in fact, I must add, no less important. We remain deeply committed to helping our community recover from the ongoing effects of the pandemic. And as such, we are actively working on an anti-poverty initiative to help our community care for those most in need of support. The initiative in close partnership with a number of organizations and experts across our community will address food insecurity, housing and financial insecurity, job training and placement, and mental health and domestic abuse. It is a continuation and expansion of the critical work that we developed during the crisis and that continues within our community. And so we must collectively act to help people in need. At the same time, we'll also be doubling our efforts to bring people together around the complex and vital issues affecting Jewish life and peoplehood. Most of which I must admit, have no straightforward solutions. How do we ensure Jewish life speaks to the hopes and aspirations of all Jews? How do we respond to rising anti-Semitism and ensure a safe and secure Jewish community? How do we stay connected despite our political differences? How do we deepen our ties to the Jewish community and each other? What will our relationship to Israel look like in the coming years? And finally, what does it mean to be a thriving and engaged Jewish community in 2021 and beyond, even in the midst of so many changes going on within the Jewish community? These are the kinds of questions that drive us at Federation, not because we have the answers, but because we know how vital it is that we address them. The most recent Pew study on American Jews confirmed that we are an eclectic group. We think differently about religion, politics, Israel, Jewish identity, and even the nature of community. Rather than let these differences pull us apart, however, we are committed to bringing people together to form the kinds of connections that understand and appreciate differences, yet transcend divisions to, divisions to build a strong community. We believe the more opportunities we have to be in conversation with each other, the stronger our shared future will be. Over the past couple of years, 
we have built the underpinning to making Greater Washington the best place to live a vibrant, fulfilling, flourishing Jewish life. We have the passion, the relationships, the resources, and you, the leadership, to make this happen. As we have moved into a reopened and reimagined world, we believe wholeheartedly in our vision for an open, connected, and vibrant Jewish community. Today, we stand at an exciting precipice between what we've accomplished in the face of a crisis and what we need to do to move from a space of possibility to action. I have no doubt that we can do this. In fact, if I can leave you with one message this evening, it is that we must respond to our next set of challenges the same way we did the last. We met COVID-19 with open eyes, hearts, and minds. And that is also what we must do moving forward. Now is the time to see one another, to recognize, honor, and celebrate our unique perspectives and worldviews, and then work together to strengthen a community that can support everyone on the unique Jewish journeys. This is not easy work, but it is absolute, absolutely worthy work. And I'm looking forward to rolling up my sleeves alongside all of you. Thank you for everything that you have done and will do. Only together can we achieve the community of our greatest hopes and aspirations. Thank you. And now I am proud to introduce our keynote speaker, Nadine Epstein, Editor-in-Chief and CEO of Moment Magazine. Late last week, I had the opportunity to sit down with Nadine for a conversation about the state of community today. Nadine and her team at Moment focused on this topic for a most recent issue and brought together incredibly thoughtful and thought-provoking pieces by leading authors, teachers, scholars, and others to answer the question, what does community mean in the 21st century? As you'll see in her remarks to us tonight, Nadine shares her own thoughtful perspective on the topic, as well as where we can go from here. Please enjoy Nadine's remarks, as well as part of my conversation with her afterwards. I want to tell you about a conversation I had with a dear friend the other day. He's brilliant and absolutely wonderful. But he's so upset with some Jews who hold different opinions that he does that he thinks it's time to bring back excommunication. And he knows exactly which Jews he believes needs to be excommunicated. That is, pushed out of the Jewish community forever. Labeled as traitors. He knows, of course, that there's no one Jewish authority that can do that. And he knows he's treading on controversial ground, even to utter this thought to me. But he's afraid. He's afraid of the coming divides he sees, that he foresees, that will tear the Jewish community apart. The Jewish community is that fragile in his mind. I feel for him. He's experienced terrible tragedy in his lifetime, and I understand his fear. This is where he has landed. I've landed elsewhere. I see the Jewish community as one of the oldest continuous religious and cultural communities in human history. It has adapted in a gazillion ways to get to where we are today, which is a vast flexible sea of community containing delightfully conflicting streams of thought, belief, practice, ritual, custom, culture, geography, stories, and so on. There are so many ways and so many places to find meaning within the Jewish community. This richness has made it resilient, more resilient than many communities. It's withstood horrific persecution and in fact, these tragedies have become part of its spirit, propelling it forward and, of course, sideward and backward as well. But here we are, living in a deeply polarized world, re-emerging at what we hope is the end of the COVID-19 era. We are at the dawn of a new time, and it's a moment to pause and to reflect. What can we do beyond excommunicating each other? 
And I'm not talking about the historic harem kind of excommunication, such as the ones against Shabbatai Zvi and Spinoza. I'm talking about the modern ways people attempt to excommunicate others they disagree with, such as labeling and calling them names, dismissing them, trying to cancel them, trying to undermine their credibility. Some of this is old news. Our upcoming issue of Moment includes an exploration of Jewish jokes, and among them is the old story about a new rabbi who sees the congregation fighting over whether or not to stand during the Shema. Later, he asks the old rabbi, what is our custom? What do I do? And the old rabbi says, this is our custom to disagree. How to come to agreement or to civilly agree to disagree is something I think about every day as editor-in-chief of Moment. At this particular juncture in history, I believe that publishing just one point of view out of context is often not useful. Publishing two opinions to create a debate can actually be dangerous if not done properly. That's because debate, this old fashioned style of argument can increase polarization. That's why we created the Big Question Project at Moment. It's a methodology for our time, a methodology that we believe builds community. By carefully curating a conversation, by interviewing a selected group of thinkers and doers who represent different viewpoints along various spectrums, we create a context for deeper understanding to occur. Through the selection, the interviewing, the editing, the organizing processes, we discover ripples of confluence, nuance. The solutions, the bridges, the community building are all in the nuance. In essence, we build a community platform for co-creation, a jumping off point for the future. To do this properly takes a lot of thought, time, and intuition. But we do it regularly, nevertheless, because it's important and necessary for our readers and for the Jewish community. Over the years, we've applied this process to many questions, but I'd like to tell you about one. This spring, we asked, what does community mean in the 21st century, and where do we go from here? It struck a real chord. The concept of community is central to Judaism and the ethos of the Jewish people. The community, our way of organizing our collective lives, has evolved over time. In the 21st century, it's been rocked by philosophical, technological, social, economic upheavals, such as globalization and hyper-individualism. Many of the old comforting patterns of affiliation identity have changed. Both social media and the pandemic have made this worse. We talked to thoughtful people such as Israeli President Reuven Rivlin, writer and mikveh activist Anita Diamond, tech thinkers Sherry Turkle, columnist David Brooks, philosophers Susan Neiman and Michael Goodman, Israeli writer A.B. Yehoshua, Stanford anthropologist T.M. Lerman, and many others. We also talked to people outside the Jewish community, such as Smithsonian Secretary Lonnie Bunch, because, of course, questions of community are not exclusively Jewish. I know you have a copy of our big question about community, and I hope you'll read what they have to say about the community past, present, and future. There's a lot of wisdom there, and read together, their thoughts provide context and perspective. Also, you'll find fresh ideas that came out of this conversation. These are very exciting. I'm not going to talk about them right now, but they're worth reading. What I want to stress is what we as a community in Washington, D.C. can learn from this Big Question Project a project that has just the right tone and breadth that allows people to read and absorb it without bumping into triggers that turn them off. For starters, to strengthen and reimagine our community, we need to be curious. We need to ask questions when we meet people we disagree with. I'm always amazed by how many people don't ask questions. And I don't want you to just ask. We have to listen. And while we're listening, we can't argue. There's a fallacy floating around that change comes through argument. There are many components to creating change, but these days 
Very few adults that I know change their mind through an argument with someone else. Arguments don't work well in polarized times. Finding the right tone that allows listening to occur is far more effective. This is a skill we all need to practice. If we can find the right tone, the other person has a better chance of finding it too. And while we are listening, we need to set aside fear, especially unacknowledged fear. If we're running on fear, we can't hear and we can't listen. And listening is connected to trust. As former Secretary of State George Shultz wrote shortly before his death this year, positive breakthroughs and understanding are built on trust. To get to trust or even to the possibility of trust, you have to listen. It is from small personal connections, be they about sports or music or anything from which trust grows over time. Long term, these connections lead to finding small patches of agreement that allow us to coexist as a stronger community and can even lead to new understandings and change down the line. Another point, we have to continue to break down barriers between insiders and outsiders in the Jewish community. Yes, we live in this vast sea of community today, but we humans, of course, are more comfortable in small communities, but we can't dwell inside of these small units completely. Insider Judaism gets very stuffy and small-minded. And I'd like to say that I think a lot of progress has been made locally in this department. Gill's expansion of who is welcome has made a difference in Washington. And here is the connected point. We have to force ourselves out of our comfortable personal and professional information bubbles or echo chambers. I went for a walk recently with someone I met on Facebook who I knew I disagreed with. I was a little nervous, but it turned out to be a great Shabbat afternoon. We didn't argue, we listened. It was invigorating. I didn't change my mind about anything, but I did expand my understanding and I learned a few new things and we discovered a lot of things that we did agree on. Lastly, the Jewish community is a project that is undertaken from generation to generation, Lador Vador. My mom, Ruth Epstein, who's been gone nine years now, worked her way up to become executive director of a JCC in New Jersey. It happened to be a community split between Ashkenazis and Syrians, and she had the personal kindness and the people skills to hold two very different groups together in one community. Much later, long after she retired, the two communities broke apart and the JCC went bankrupt and it closed. But one of my brothers has rescued it, and although it's not quite the same, it's a flourishing JCC again. I've tried to take the lessons I've learned from my mom out into the world through a moment. We all know the quote from Perquet Avolt, you are not obligated to complete the work, but neither are you free to desist from it. If the work is strengthening Jewish community, then no generation can complete the work. Each generation can only build and rebuild Jewish community for its time with an eye on its understanding and on its hopes for the future. We too can seize the moment. Thank you. So uh, Nadine, thank you so much for that. That was really uh, fascinating. Um, I have a question because you brought together two uh, significant issues. One is about uh, conversations and different perspectives and the second is about community. When you were thinking about this, why those two as part of um, one conversation? I think because our converse, our community is so split along so many lines. And as, as, as an editor of Moment and also just as a human being, I happen to have the opportunity to flip between many communities. And I make an effort to flip between many communities as well. And even within my family, there's so many different communities. So the ability to have a conversations 
with those various communities helps to strengthen the the general Jewish community. So they're very connected in my mind. Do you feel that you know, when you look, where we're looking today and looking forward, obviously the debates and the divisions and the conflicts, you know, whether you call it cancel culture or whatever, um, do you feel that that will end up ripping apart the Jewish community or do we have the capacity to get past that? So I started this talk with this, this uh, kind of mentioning this conversation I had the other day. But this is absolutely amazingly, lovely, brilliant man who feels the need to excommunicate people. And I started with that because one, we are in our own ways often trying to excommunicate each other. We just don't use that word. Um, and so there are many levels of excommunication or attempted excommunication occurring. And, um, and I think we need to be very careful about that. Um, but I think that, um, and I'm sorry, I blank. What was the second part of your question? Well, whether we'll be able to, whether, whether that tendency, um, which is increasingly kind of prevalent in America, um, will rip apart the Jewish community. So I actually think that the Jewish community is more resilient than we think. Um, and I, but it, it could, and one of the reasons why it's so important to have these conversations, and I spend so much time on these big questions and on trying to talk to people from a different point of view, is because there really is, there are places of nuance, of understanding. There are places where we agree, and we need to spend time finding those because in the nuance are the creative ideas. In the nuance is the future. Hanging on to these very tight, very, you know, patterns of what kind of traditional Jewish thoughts are for whatever the different part, and I'm not just talking about traditional Judaism, you know, different denominations have very specific ways of looking at things, different political, people with different political uh, perspectives have very different views of looking at the world. But there's so much nuance. Um, I actually have a, a dear relative uh, who is, couldn't be farther on the political spectrum from me. Um, he's on a very extreme part of the political spectrum. But when I talk to him, we find a lot of places where we agree. And we do get to um, this through this sort of wonderful trusting conversation we find ways to meet minds and even be on the same page. And that's very special. And I feel like a lot of people don't take that time to do that. And also they try to do it by arguing. You know, we all know, I know it's so much easier to go, here are the facts, A, B, C, D, E. Here's why you should not think that. I find that that's a very, just not an effective way of talking to people. It's not an effective way of having a conversation today. So I, I guess that the, the follow up there. So what do you do? I mean, I've had this conversation with people and say, well, I can't talk to them. What do I do? You know, you can't just tell me to go up and have a conversation with someone with whom I completely disagree because it goes nowhere. So, I mean, you do it partly because you come out of journalism. You're a journalist. So but what do you do? Like, what advice would you have for people to have a healthy conversation with whom they may significantly disagree. So I think so one of the things I was saying here tonight is that being very thoughtful about your tone, um, don't start with arguing, don't even necessarily need to talk about the things that you disagree with. You need to talk about the things, you need to find the places that you can agree. A lot of people are not conscious of their tone you know, we start these conversations with, I'm right, here are my assumptions, and you're wrong, and I'm trying to convince you. That's just not a very effective tool. Um, I think the the tone and the asking questions, when people, when I, I mean, I talk to lots of people, and not just as a journalist, but, you know, as a human being, my first thing I do is, why do you think that way? 
what is it? What tell me? And it's actually they're often not accustomed to being asked that question. They're just expecting me to go, you're wrong. And I'm saying, but why? Um, and I'm not saying, but why? Like, you're a jerk. I disagree with you. I'm trying to find the right tone and say, I just like to know. I want to understand. And I don't want to, I don't take that information and then throw it back in their face. I listen and then I move on because I've learned something about that person. I've learned something about their point of view. And now I know a little bit more about them. But that's a, having that information is huge. Does that, does that make sense? Absolutely. I mean, it reminded me um, a couple of years ago, um, I was in a learning program and uh, the teacher talked about, you know, who's the one who wins an argument, yes. right? Is it the person who keeps to their perspective or the person who learns something and, change their, and changes their mind? And, and it's an interesting question. So you're approaching the conversation with curiosity, with a desire to understand, as opposed to an effort to convince and win. And it's a very different approach, which is not always easy, but I think it's really important for us to, to take on. So um, thank you for that. So, and really, and, and change doesn't necessarily come through argument. I mean, I just spent, you know, a lot of the last couple of years working on a book with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. And one of the things that we talk about in the book and that she talks about is that um, she always tried to keep emotion out of her conversations. Um, she's looking for, you know, look, you're looking for long-term change. You're not looking for like an immediate winning, you know, and even if people, like when you have a conversation with someone and even a person ends up going, oh, you're right, that, that's often just meaningless. Um, it's not about being right. It's about, it's about understanding. And also remembering we're in this for the long term. And one of the, some of the advice we give to people in the book is that you find ways to connect with someone. And once they, you, they trust you as a human being, they're much more open to hearing what you think about the world and perhaps even considering it. Right. So um, I want to go out and talk a little bit about the community, because obviously the theme that you had for that edition of the, of the Moment magazine was all different perspectives about community. How do we rebuild it? What are the challenges? Um, it's something that a lot of us have been struggling with through the pandemic, where our sense of community has diminished and our circles have gotten smaller. And I, I guess, you know, for you, looking at all those different viewpoints, um, and um, first of all, I'd love to hear, were there a couple of ideas um, within that whole set um, that particularly sparked your interest um, and what those might be? Um, and I, I guess, you know, beyond that, um, are you optimistic about community, not just Jewish community, but beyond? Okay, well, let's talk about the first one. Um, well, first, let's actually step back even a little bit here, because this whole conversation came out. We started it in the darkest, the darkest period of the pandemic. And it was a conversation I had with uh, Andre Spaconi of the Jewish Funders Network. And we were in a conversation lamenting the breakdown of old communities. And then we thought, well, let's do something about it. Let's try this methodology and see what we come up with. And we, so that's what we did. And I feel like we actually came up with a lot of different ways of thinking about community. We had people who were conservative, who felt very threatened by changes and felt like older communities were the best ones. And then we had other people who invented new ideas for community. And I think that that's part of the conversation, um, being a little general, just a little simplistic in that. Um, I mean, actually, one of my favorites was Anita Diamond. Um, and Anita, Anita Diamond is, is known as an author. And she wrote The Red Tent. And she wrote many other books. And she's also did something I think was very creative because she was someone who grew up very much part 
who lived her adult life very much in the synagogue model of Judaism. And she still participates in that. But her interest in the mikvah led her to create this a mikvah that was a little more pluralistic and open. And it created, it sparked a whole global mikvah movement. And there are so many people who identify with Judaism through a global mikvah movement. They're not in your normal conversation. You may not bump into them on the street, but it's a global movement. And I find that she did this to be fascinating. And then she learned a huge amount along the way. One of the ideas she came up with was multi-generational Jewish co-housing. Here she is now. She's, uh, you know, I don't know how old she is exactly, but she's not, she's not old, but she's not young. And she is thinking about this. She wants to be, she thinks it'd be amazing for Jewish communities to create co-housing where, you know, older people live along, alongside young people and then there's children. And yes, there's privacy. And she goes in and she explains this whole idea. But I think it's so important because there's a lot of wisdom in older Jewish communities and the older Jews of our community. And, and the youth has different kind of wisdom. And I feel like we need to be in more positions where we're communicating. We each need each other. And so I loved that idea. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I hope that you found Nadine's comments, um, remarks both inspirational and thought provoking. Before our conversation ended, Nadine shared some further thoughts and reflections about how we as the Washington community can really move forward and how we can focus on making sure that every member of our Jewish community feels that they belong. Please stay tuned for the link for the full interview, which we will share by email following our event. And now I'm proud to be sharing with you a very special video that I am sure you will all enjoy. With a pandemic, with a deep recession, the question is, who is going to bring together the community? Who is going to bring together the people and the organizations and the resources to address such a large problem? And that's what the Federation does. Immediately upon the outset of the pandemic, um, Federation quickly raised an emergency relief fund, um, recognizing that there were going to be certain institutions that were going to really struggle both in terms of revenue and in terms of being able to reach all of the, the people that they needed to. Without any hesitation, Federation stepped up and filled that void and did exactly what they're supposed to do. And, and that is to be the glue that helps keep our Jewish community strong and vibrant. They really mobilized the troops, they mobilized the donors, they mobilized community builders, those that were in need were taken care of. Those are the things that the Federation always does, but they did it in like hyper speed. This year, Jewish Federation kept people connected by um, putting on programming, but it wasn't just random programming. It was thoughtfully put together and it was both interesting and also important and it highlighted where the needs are. As a federation, we get the leader that we need at that particular moment in time. And I've worked with a wide range of leaders. Little did we know what we were going to enter into, obviously, with a pandemic, with the recession and other challenges that we faced as a community. Mark was the perfect president for the past two years. Mark was a very, very energetic child. His ability for leadership was evident from maybe his young teens. I never had to push him, it just was a natural ability. Mark became president of Federation two years ago when there were needs and they were pretty immediate. He just immediately went into overdrive. He loves a challenge and does not give up on anything. He's got a, an air of peacefulness about him. He was the ideal person to take what the role threw at him and, and deal with it. My uncle is just somebody who leads by example and I think that that's really what this year called for. He was forever connecting with people and having that one-on-one -on -one with Mark, you walk away saying, I want to be part of his team. He enjoys Jewish learning, not just for the sake of it, but because it helps him become a better leader and a better person. And he then wants to use it to strengthen our community and our Jewish life collectively. 
in that way, Mark really embodies kind of that full sense of what a Jewish leader can be. We have friends this year who've, you know, stepped up to be on um, committee roles or board roles. And I think a lot of that uh, has happened this year under my uncle's leadership. He's just become someone that, that people look up to. I think when Mark looks back on these last two years, he will, of course, be proud of the Federation and the community for having rallied the troops to combat COVID. But I think what he's most proud of, perhaps, is knowing that when he leaves this office, the Federation is in excellent hands. Mark, I want to thank you for your partnership. I want to thank you for your support, for your engagement, for your passion. I also want to thank you for your friendship. You've been a true partner in everything that we've done and I will forever appreciate that. I'd just like to tell Mark, um, you know, both how, how proud I am of him and uh, you know, how he inspires me to be uh, a better leader. He's always just been a role model to me in the community. I'm so appreciative of all that he's done to carry, carry this Jewish community through the toughest of years. We are all stronger and bolder and kinder because of Mark. I'm glad it was him in that scene. I have so much more admiration for him after these last two years, and he pushes people in a great way to do things that they wouldn't normally do or to think in a way that they wouldn't normally think. Mark's dad, of blessed memory, would be so proud of Mark and the accomplishments and the person that he is. We are very fortunate to have such a wonderful son. Mark, thank you for all that you do for the Federation. You made Washington a better place because of your involvement. I'm very, very proud of you. This was very unfair. <laughs> I, uh, there, there are two movies that always make me cry, The Sound of Music and The Music Man. And now I have a third. That was uh, just so beautiful. Thank you so much. I, I obviously love, appreciate, and respect everyone who spoke, and I will cherish these words forever. Thank you so much. And, and in particular, I want to shout out to what certainly one of the most important role models in my life, my 90 year young mother who is zooming in from Des Moines for this. Mom, I love you and I will see you in Des Moines tomorrow. Before I call on Johanna Chanin, the Vice President for Leadership and Volunteer Development, also my sister-in-law, to deliver the nominations for Federation's board, I wanna thank the outgoing members of our executive committee for their service. Brian Ashen, Scott Brown, Lisa Levy, Norman Pozes, Jeffrey Rum, Samantha Sasiski, and Michelle Stravitz. I'm not sure any previous executive committee has been called on to meet as often and make as many decisions as you did this past year. Thank you for stepping up to meet the challenge. Congratulations to the incoming executive committee, which was recently approved by the Federation Board of Directors. The executive committee members are as follows. Robin Hedelman Weinberg, Vice President for Financial Resource Development. Julie Cass, VP for Strategic Planning and Allocations Local. Kevin Fishkind, VP for St Strategic Planning and Allocations Israel and Overseas. Jeffrey Distenfeld, Treasurer and VP for Finance. Johanna Chainen, VP for Leadership and Volunteer Development. Bradley Buslick, VP for the Network. Carrie Iris, VP for Women's Philanthropy. Josh Brown, VP for Women's Philanthropy. David Selden, VP at Large. David Yaffe, Secretary. Jocelyn Krischer and Melanie Nestorf, Presidential Appointees. Gary Berman and yours truly, past presidents. Deborah Ratner Salzberg, president of the United Jewish Endowment Fund. Paul Berger, outside counsel. Gil Proust, executive vice president and CEO. 
And last, but certainly not least, I want to congratulate Sam Kaplan on becoming the next president of the Jewish Federation. Sam, I have seen you in action as a leader in several capacities, and I could not be more thrilled to have you as my successor. Sam, when, when I became president of the Federation two years ago, I was not presented with a gavel. Admittedly, because my executive committees and boards were always so civil and respectful, I never felt the need to use a gavel. However, I think it is important to always be prepared. So for $21 on Amazon, I purchased this beautiful, genuine gavel, and I'm donating it to Federation in case you should ever need it. Perhaps in a future version of Zoom, I would be able to hand this directly to you through the screen. Sam, my, my passing of the gavel to you tonight is of course merely a symbolic transfer of responsibility. More important, I am handing off to you the gratifying yet humbling opportunity to lead our Federation forward in building a vibrant Jewish community in greater Washington. You will have the support of a very talented and committed executive committee and a board of directors, which is becoming more and more representative of the significant diversity in our Jewish community. You are gonna love working with Gil and his exceptional and dedicated professional team at Federation. Our community is blessed to have Gil as the Federation CEO. This past year, he led us with a steady hand through so many difficult and unprecedented decisions, and I never saw him lose his focus or composure. Gil, the opportunity to partner with you was the primary reason I was willing to serve as president and I am gonna miss our weekly interaction. Sam, you are assuming this leadership responsibility at a very interesting time. We are quickly emerging from the pandemic and life is getting back to normal yet. I think we all know the Washington Jewish community is just not gonna be the same. As my rabbi Greg Harris said to me just the other day, we don't want to let go of all the disruption. We still have more questions and answers about, about what the Jewish community will look like post-COVID, <clears throat> but I'm highly confident Federation will be instrumental in helping to figure that out. I think the challenge facing all leadership in our Washington Jewish community is to find the right balance between the disruption we ought to retain and the norms and practices we should re-embrace. So Sam, I look forward to supporting you in your tenure as president. And I wanna thank this wonderful Washington Jewish community for the support you have provided the Federation and me over the past two years. It is now my pleasure to call on Johanna to deliver Federation's nominations report. Thank you, Mark. Or as you'll now be known, Mr. Immediate, past president, quite possibly, at least in my view, the most coveted title in all of Jewish communal life. Mazal Tov on completing your term in which you not only survived, but thrived under extraordinary circumstances. Now to the business at hand. On behalf of the leadership and nominating committee and my co-chair, Jess Scher, I am very pleased to give the nominations report to the Federation membership. Before introducing the slate of board nominees, I want to recognize and thank our outgoing board, board members for their service, dedication, and leadership, both within Federation and across the community. This was a year like no other. The board confronted challenges with no roadmap, but we had our internal compass and the directives of our tradition. I am immensely proud to have been on the board with you, together with the professional team, to address the urgent and emerging needs presented by the pandemic. You serve this community well. And while not quite as enjoyable as being together in person, I personally found it very warm and loved seeing your faces in their little boxes on the Zoom screen month after month. Those at-large board members whose terms are concluding are Glenn Benson, Morgan Genderson, Joel Goldhammer, Carol Gordon, Marcy Handler, Sheldon Klein, William Kreisberg, Rochelle Kupfer, Dr. Stuart Lessons, Meryl Rosenberg, David Selden, Ben Schlesinger, and Stuart Tauber. Thank you all.
The nominating committee set for itself an ambitious goal to engage community builders who would broaden our table and add a diversity of perspectives and, and experiences to the work of the Federation Board. Ours is a large communal board engaging in generative thinking and collectively confronting the biggest issues facing our community. We know that engaging the fullness of the Jewish community adds to the strength of our work and the wisdom and quality of our decisions. The efforts of the committee resulted in a remarkable and diverse slate of candidates from Northern Virginia, suburban Maryland and the district whose skills and experience include Jewish educators accomplished both locally and nationally, a talented leader bringing communities within the streams of Judaism and the broader community together, a financial services professional with intense engagement and interest in Northern Virginia Hillel and transitioning college students to community engagement upon graduation, a nonprofit executive focused on the eradication of racism, anti-Semitism, and all forms of discrimination a law firm partner with expertise in cybersecurity matters, a champion of young adult education, engagement, a diversity and racial equity consultant, highly accomplished business and medical entrepreneurs, a seasoned Federation leader who recently moved here from another area of the country, participants in Federation's community leadership program, and an expert in homeland security and combating violent extremism. As you can well understand, I am honored to propose the nominees for the coming year's new at-large board members. Benham Dianim, Sean Epstein, Sharon Frundell, Robin Garnett, David Canstaroom, Danielle Kaplan, Dr. Mark Levitt, Dr. Dietra Reiser, Yolanda Savage-Narva, Craig Simon, and Michelle Zuckerman. In addition to these individuals, first time board members to be voted on tonight also include Daniel Raskus, who served two years of an unexpired term and is nominated for his first full three year term, and Jeff Rum and Samantha Sasiski, who both joined the board having completed their executive committee terms. The full slate of new and renewing board members whose election you will be voting on momentarily appears on this slide. In addition to those named earlier, the following are renewing board members. Michael Flyer, Toby Frank, Ellen Kagan Wagelstein, Leslie Kaplan, Benjamin Nussdorf, Marissa Schlafer, Lawrence Sidman, and Edward Weiss. We likewise welcome to the board three presidential appointees who've also completed terms on the executive committee, Brian Ashen, Scott Brown, and Michelle Stravitz. I'd like to conclude the report of the Leadership and Nominating Committee by thanking the committee members for their dedication to this important work. I loved working with each of you. I now turn it back to you, Mark. Thank you, Johanna, and uh, your co-chair, Jess, and the members of the Nominating Committee and the professionals who supported you, uh, your, the thoughtfulness of your process and, and uh, the quality of the members you've brought is, is really sensational. So it is now my pleasure to recommend the uh, new and continuing nominees for the Federation Board positions, uh, the list were on the screen. And consistent with the procedures set forth in the Federation's bylaws, I would like to now invite all members of Federation to vote to approve the presented slate of 2021-2022 at-large board members that you see on the screen. And if you're eight, to be a voting member, if you're 18 years or older, uh, a donor of $18 or more to the Federation and you reside in Greater Washington, you are deemed a member of the Federation. I'd like to uh, ask for a motion to approve this slate. Jerry Herman, I see you. Would you make a motion? I'm going to take that as a yes. Yes, I'm just unmuting. Okay, thank you. Eva Davis, would you mind seconding the motion? You're muted, but I can read your lips. 
Ah, I don't think you can, uh, you, you don't have, thank you. I, I get the motion. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, and with that, uh, Emily, would you please put the poll up for voting? Unfortunately, we are having some technical difficulties. So if you can please raise your hand, if you agree or say aye. All those in favor? Let me check the next screen. I see lots of thumbs up, lots of hands. I think we've got a quorum and a majority. Wonderful. Thank you, thank you and uh, Mazal Tov to, and welcome to all of the new and returning board members for the Federation. With that, Gil, I will turn it over to you to close out the meeting. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Johanna. Thank you, everyone who joined us for this evening. Um, and thank you for making this community so wonderful and strong. Um, I'd like to once again uh, thank the Federation professional team, especially the team uh, for tonight, including Emily and Donna and Elisa, um, who put so much work behind this uh, together. So thank you for everything that you've done. Um, and thank you for all the new board members who will be joining us. We look forward to getting together um, and being with you um, over the coming years as we um, help lead uh, this Jewish community. With that, um, I would like to invite everyone, we will unmute, I believe, everyone. And I would like to also invite you to share a thought or a greeting within the chat function. Um, and uh, just from our side, uh, thank you for being with us. Um, have a wonderful summer. And if we don't see you beforehand, looking forward to seeing you um, at the first board meeting of the year. Thank you. Thank you.